Welcome back to Maritime Morning. It's our uh, medical edition today. We just uh, finished up with Dr. John Gillis here, and uh, we're bringing in another doctor, uh, Dr. Stan Kucher, who's uh, heads up the uh, psychiatry unit uh, here in Halifax and has done a considerable amount of work in uh, teen mental health and uh, a variety of different areas. Um, and we thought it would be good to have him come in and talk uh, about uh, something that's called the DSM-5. Uh, probably not something, unless you uh, are a, a practitioner, I suppose, or somebody who, you know, who has a, a deep and abiding knowledge of the uh, mental health system, would find um, you know, on your bookshelf. Uh, the, the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And this is a guidebook that is used by doctors around the globe. But this, what they do is they, they, they redefine from time to time uh, conditions and syndromes and whatnot. And, uh, and that's an important process because what it does is it informs how, uh, I guess, some of these things are diagnosed and, and also how they are uh, acted upon. And, and to some degree, I suppose, how they're per- perceived by the general public. So Stan Kucher joins us this morning uh, to talk about this. Welcome to the studio, Stan. Great to have Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, t- I, I've... Guess I've characterized this. Maybe maybe you can fill in the blanks there in terms of what this diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders is all about. Sure. I think probably the first thing to do is to understand that in all of medicine, there is something called the diagnostic manual, which mm-hmm. is used by doctors globally all over the world. The, 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 the granddaddy of them is called the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD, which has components in it dealing with heart disease, lung disease, immune diseases, and mental disorders. It, pr- it provides a commonality for physicians around the world so that they understand what they're talking about, I suppose, isn't it? That exactly. What about? That's what it's for. And, and, and it undergoes revisions periodically as new science comes in, as new information comes in. So we don't, we don't think about heart disease and diagnose heart disease the same way today that we did 100 years ago because we've learned a lot. And along that pathway, we've had some good successes and we've had some missteps, and, and, and that's how it happens. The same thing for mental disorders. Although mental disorders are part of ICD, a number of years ago, a couple of decades ago, because mental disorders were really neglected, there was a movement, mostly from the United States, but a globalized movement to create a diagnostic manual for mental disorders specifically. So that's what the DSM is. And it has the same strengths and weaknesses of any diagnostic system. And it goes periodically, it undergoes revisions, hopefully to improve it. And sometimes that turns out to be the right direction, and sometimes it turns out to be the wrong direction. Well, presumably, with and I guess, you know, in all areas of mental, or I mean, medical research, I mean, there's been great advancements, but, uh, but perhaps even more so in, you know, the diagnosis of mental illnesses because of the huge advances we've seen in brain research in the last while and, and how that relates to, I mean, the work that you're doing, for example, if we were to take... I guess our perceptions of mental illnesses five years ago, they've probably you know, been turned on their head in the last five years, you know, even, as I say, in the work that's been done uh, within your unit. Well, you know, I think you're right. Uh, we have learned a heck of a lot in the last decade, in the last 15 years. Uh, but as somebody who knows a little bit of what we've learned, I am incredibly humbled by how much more we have yet to learn. Mm-hmm. And... and, and I realize that a lot of what we think we know we will change as new information comes in. The the technologies that we have had available for us to study the brain and its functions are very new technologies. And so we're really on the path to to, to learning a lot more. And and this manual is part of that path of learning. So it, it, it has two functions. First of all, it has a diagnostic function. It basically says that Regardless of where you go, a physician, as long as they're a physician or a psychologist or, or a clinical nurse specialist or, or whatever is the health provider, will use the same criteria to say that this is what you have. So it, it's, it's a hypothesis about what is the person is suffering from, and it's a hypothesis that then leads to a specific intervention because we 
study our interventions based on these hypotheses. Okay. Well, the reason that we wanted to talk about this was that there. I guess, I guess when you change definitions or you you remove things or you know put things under different umbrellas that you know is going to have an impact on people who are dealing with those conditions. There's a couple of them in here. The first one uh, that we're going to talk about, uh, and there are a couple, but the first one was this. Uh, somatic symptom disorder. Now, uh, this is due to be published in May. This this new uh, this new manual, and as it was described in the media reports that I read, that there's a, a I guess a controversy around this because what it could do is it could label many people who have um, legitimate medical illnesses as psychiatrically sick if the treatment. Or if in you know if they're in need of treatment, that if they worry excessively, whatever that means, about the symptoms. So, um, what is somatic symptom disorder, and is there is there a danger here in labeling something? I guess we used to did we used to call this hypochondria? Was that what that was about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I agree with your criticism. So uh, I'm one of the people that has some positive things to say about DSM, but a number of criticisms about it. Okay. And, and one of my criticisms is that the line between what one calls a disorder and what one calls a problem or distress or everyday life or that's understandable kind of reaction to things is sometimes not easily defined. And depending on the prevailing gestalt or viewpoint at that time, that line shifts back and forth. And sometimes that shift is due to scientific knowledge. And sometimes that shift is due to ideology or social pressures or whatever. So in my own personal opinion, I am concerned that that particular diagnostic category may be so wide and so poorly defined as to expand the concept of disorder into the more common world of problem or distress. So the question is, where do you cut nature at the joints? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Well, if it, is being, if it is being characterized as a disorder, I guess what, the, you know, the, the, what you extrapolate from that is that therefore there is a treatment. Uh, and, uh, I, or is that, what, is that what the idea of creating a disorder or characterizing something as a disorder is that therefore you uh, then can actually take action to treat this in some way? That, that, that's a really important part of it. And it's not the whole piece, right. but it is a part of it. So, uh, yes. So if there are effective treatments, so for example, for this particular construct, a whole slew of psychological interventions are probably going to be shown to be effective. So ways of intervening to help people with these kind of symptoms from the mental health perspective. Health psychology, for example, has been doing this for decades, uh -huh. okay? Intervening to help people with these difficulties. Now, the question that that begs is, is this a unique phenomenon? And do you actually have to have a diagnosis of a disorder in order to get treatment? And that's where things get a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And that's where social factors and economic factors enter the picture and make it more problematic. So, for example, if an insurance company will pay for a health provider, psychologist, nurse, doctor, doesn't matter, for treatment for a disorder, but will not pay for treatment for a problem or distress, then sometimes people say, oh, well, in that case, let's call it a disorder. I'm not saying that's what happened in DSM. But you can see where the, where the line gets a little bit slippery here. Well, I can also see where there are opportunities for somebody who feels that there may be some kind of a, a, you know, if, uh, a psychiatric intervention using uh, some sort of a pharmaceutical would say, well, this, this, dis this, disorder, this pharmaceutical may be useful in treating this disorder, so therefore somebody is going to and <clears throat> pardon me if i you know if i have any skepticism about you know big pharma but there 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 if there's an economic opportunity that they say okay well this this particular drug is useful in treating this particular disorder and then it becomes you you'd start drawing the lines there and then if 
a doctor goes in, they see that it's identified as such, it has all of these characteristics, and they say, okay, well, then I'm going to go to that and perhaps prescribe that. Because there are doctors that prescribe drugs, uh, you know, for depression, which, you know, and doctors that are not psychiatrists. Well, I think, I think, frankly, most GPs should be able to prescribe properly for depression. But let, let me take your point because I think it, it's a well-founded point. And I think people understand that point when, when you frame it in the way that you just did in terms of the pharmacologic treatment mm-hmm. because people have a, their antenna up and say, why yeah. are you giving me a medicine for something that might be just a health, real-life problem? Like you don't treat – because I'm demoralized after I lost my job, you don't give me an antidepressant. You give me a job for crying out loud, okay? That's, <laughs> that's what we want to do. So, so well, but, yeah, yeah okay. but I just also want to point out is that – there is a pharma industry, but there is a huge psychotherapy industry. It's right. probably bigger than the pharma industry, and it has no controls on it. So there is no place that you can go. If you're going to see someone who's a psychotherapist, you, and they put their shingle out, if they are a professional like a psychologist or a social worker, they can be regulated under the Professions Act, but if they're not, there's no regulation of any kind. Wait, wait. And, and hang on. And there is no structure like the Health Canada or the Food and Drug Administration that says this psychotherapy has shown that it's been effective in these part, particular kinds of conditions. So there are huge industries around all this kind of health stuff, some of which are pharmaceutical, some of which are psychotherapeutic. And then there's another industry around all this stuff, and that is the industry of academia, of which I am a part. And the industry of academia, people make their lives, livings, and livelihood championing particular perspectives or criticizing particular perspectives. Reporters make money writing books, attacking pharma, attacking psychotherapy. Psychotherapists make fortunes writing books about their particular psychotherapy. Pharmas make money selling their drugs. This is a confusing area. It is. It's called real life. (laughs) (laughs) This is why we have you in here to try and (laughs) sort it out, I guess. Uh, Dr. Stan Kutcher is in the studio with us. We're just talking about uh, this book, uh, this manual. It's called the DSM-5. There's a couple of things in here as well that I think for people who have been dealing with issues, uh, for example, uh, Asperger's has been removed from this definition. We're going to talk about that, find out uh, why that is, and perhaps why some of these uh, hierarchies that uh, previously uh, protected against uh, overdiagnosis may have been eliminated in all of this. We'll talk with uh, Dr. Stan Kutcher and some more about... uh, DSM-5, right after this on Maritime Morning. Welcome back to Maritime Morning. Dr. Stan Kutcher is in studio with us this morning. Having Dr. Kutcher in here is always a little difficult for me because there's a hundred different things that I want to ask him. (laughs) And we only have so much time to talk about it. Um, We were talking about uh, these new definitions and whatnot of of syndromes, and, and Asperger's is one that has been moved, I guess. Now it's, I guess it's in this new thing, it's called uh, autism spectrum disorder, which what is, 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 a, is an umbrella term for a great, does it, get, does it give somebody like you a better handle on a variety of different conditions that exist in, you know, in somebody who may be suffering from some form of autism? Well, this has been, of course, a, an area of some debate for quite some time. Um, and if you look at the prevalence, that's how much in the population there is at any point in time of autism. Uh, 20 years ago, the prevalence was quite low. Today, it's much higher. It's uh, increased by a huge factor. It isn't that more people have suddenly become autistic as the diagnostic criteria have changed. And there are many reasons for those changes in diagnostic criteria, some of which are scientific, that we've got a better understanding of the various components of these disorders. Um, there is always a discussion, is something categorical like by itself or is it part of a spectrum? Mm-hmm. Those discussions happen not only in, in psychiatric medicine but in all the rest of medicine. Um, and, uh, and frankly, things like legislation uh, that provides treatment for autistic young people um, has helped push the diagnostic categories wider because now the state will will pay for some of the treatments that these kids so desperately need. And again, you're always, you know, this is the, 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 the dilemma that you're faced with is here you have a young person that clearly need treatment 
And if they don't meet the, the very constricted diagnosis, they still need treatment, right? Mm-hmm. So in a third-party payer, who pays for that treatment? Is it always the parent? Is the, does the state have some responsibility? So um, you know, I think one of the problems that we have with this is that we fund treatments based on categories when people aren't categories. So I, I would rather us say, yeah, we can have categories, but we can fund treatment based on people's needs. And that would get us out of this conundrum, I think. It was an interesting quote from a psychologist by the name of Frank Farley when he was referring to this somatic uh, syndrome. or soma- Let me get the right terminology for it anyway here. It was, uh, uh, we were talking about early somatic symptom disorder anyway. What he was uh, saying was that he was concerned that we risk there being a sickening of society, if you will, by uh, labeling people with a serious physical illness as mentally ill as well as deli- and, and what it does, uh, who are physically sick, saying that they are mentally ill as well as a part of that, uh, saying that it's sort of a double whammy diagnosis. Does this not speak to, I guess, the, that common perception that mental illness and physical illness are two distinct things when, in fact, they really are deeply entrenched or connected? Well, I, I don't know the person uh, who made the quote, but to me it seems that, that he it doesn't understand that the brain and the body are actually united. <laughs> the brain happens to be part of the body, and the body influences the brain. The brain influences all the body. The, the brain you know, controls your emotions, your cognition. It's, it's an immune organ. It, it's in control of your endocrine systems. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually regulates your heartbeat. It regulates your digestion. It, it regulates your breathing. I mean, I mean just this whole construct that somehow the brain and the rest of the body are, are different just makes absolutely no sense. You know, Descartes thought that in the 1700s. We don't have to think that in 2013. So let's get over that one. Um, and certainly when people have an illness of any part of their body, including the brain, it's going to affect other parts of the body. And people can have heart disease and diabetes. That's affecting two different organs in the body and a depression that's in fact affecting another organ of the body. So you've got three organs, brain, heart, the pancreas involved at the same time. So the issue is, is really, it would be great if we can get past this false dichotomization of brain and body and start to look and bring these together because you can't separate them. They're one and the same thing. I just want, we've only got two minutes left because I know you have to get out of here and I, I appreciate you having the time to come in and talk with us uh, for any length of time. But um, you spoke briefly about the idea of uh, MD's uh, prescribing for depression, uh, not being psychiatrists, and we look at it as a psych. Maybe, maybe, and I guess perhaps what you just said speaks to that to some degree. But are we not getting into a situation where there's an overdiagnosis for depression now? Well, I think that that uh, my concern, and I'll share my my perspective on sure. this, is that depression can be both overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed. Crying is not a mental disorder. Being unhappy. Uh, is not a mental disorder. Being demoralized, as I said earlier, because you lost your job, is not a mental disorder. Uh, someone has died and you're grieving, that is not a mental disorder, okay? So prescribing of medications to people with those difficulties is, to my opinion, not indicated. But there are people who have clear depressions and who, if they need a medication, because there are other treatments for depression, so the, the role of the physician is to make the proper diagnosis, albeit that sometimes is difficult, but that's part of the, that's why we pay the physicians to what we pay them, because mm-hmm. it's the most difficult part. The second part of that is that we tailor the treatment to the needs of the individual. So for some people, a psychological intervention is the preferred route. For other people, a psychological intervention and a medication is the preferred route. For another group of people, it may be that's the medication is the preferred route. So the issue really is not over or under prescribing. The issue is how can we reach out and train health providers, not just physicians, but all health providers to be better at understanding mental disorders, better at diagnosing, and better at linking the most useful interventions to the person's needs. That's our challenge. And part of that big part of that challenge is that many of the health providers who are currently in practice in their training never received that kind of intervention, never received that kind of education. So one of the big challenges that we have is to how do we reach out to health providers give them that kind of information in a way that makes sense to them, in a way that they can use for the benefit of the people that they're seeing. 
Stan, thanks for coming in. It's always uh, great to have you here, and uh, it's great to get your insight on, on some of these issues. Thanks again. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay. That is uh, Dr. Stan Kucher joining us this morning uh, talking about